Okay, well, let's let's get started. Aloha, Bula, Hafadei, Malo, Talofa, and whatever other greeting um, is appropriate for your location. Uh, I'm so happy to be here to present this webinar, this fifth webinar in the series presented by Breadfruit People. And um, we have an extraordinary lineup of presenters today with deep experience in breadfruit propagation. Um, but before we begin, uh, we'll have a, a little opening to set our intention for the day, our, 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 our good intentions for this webinar. So um, uh, I invite Megan to please, please do that for us. Just we'll pull it right now. Okay, pull it kako. Mahalo ke akua na amakua na kupuna. Mahalo for this day, for this gathering worldwide of people in the name of breadfruit, in the name of ulu and all that grows. We ask for your guidance over our voices, over our hearts, over our spirit and our bodies in this, this transformational times as we come together. We thank you for our, our speakers from all over the world who are coming to bless us with their experiences and their knowledge. We ask that we receive this information with open hearts and open hands, that this uh, information may be useful to us in our communities. We're so thankful for the blessings and all the learnings that you give us this day always. Mahalo for all of these things. Amama uanua. Dele ai Thank you, Megan. I will um, give a brief uh, introduction to today's webinar. If you have not attended um, one of our webinars, um, I'll give you a little bit of the logistics. Today's topic is, as I, as I mentioned, propagation systems. Uh, we're not gonna focus so much on the, 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 the techniques of propagation or the methodology of propagation, so much as the systems around propagation. Uh, their advantages, disadvantages, challenges and um, great rewards. So that's the uh, focus of today's webinar. As you are listening to presenters and questions pop up in your mind, please enter them in the Q&A box. There's a little uh, icon at the bottom of the screen called Q&A, so the question and answer box. And just type them in before they, they leave your mind because we will handle um, questions after all four presenters are complete. And so we have about 20 minutes at the end to answer questions and any residual ones that don't get answered because of time, uh, we, will, we will attempt to answer after the webinar closes. We will also have a couple of polls along the way. Um, if you're familiar with um, Zoom webinar polls, they're kind of fun, just quick and easy short little polls to, to see where uh, attendees are at in their thinking along the lines of uh, propagation or breadfruit in this case. So we'll do a couple of those. And um, uh, the, the webinar as you've seen, as you logged in is recorded uh, and we will make this available through the Breadfruit People website. And also Irene is uh, on the call here Irene will post it to Facebook and YouTube. Hey, Irene. Um, and, um, and finally, just mentioning that the, the sponsors for this activity, this uh, series of webinars, um, uh, this is funded through the Farmers Organizations for Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific program. Uh, so we're very grateful to them for this support. And I'm grateful to be working with PFON and the Breadfruit people in this capacity for this webinar. So thank you so much for that. Kyle, Irene, Ilea, and the rest of the team. Uh, so without further ado, we, um, I'd like to introduce um, Chairman Afama Sangha, who will be opening our webinar today. He is the president of the Samoa Farmers Association. He is a former ambassador for Samoa uh, to the European Union. He's a, um, uh, uh, he's a he's a leader in the community, author, consultant, and also advocate of democracy and governance. So uh, please take it away, uh, Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Craig, for that introduction, and uh, a very a very good morning to everybody once again. It's great to see you all, and. Uh, 
I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make this one, and I'm very pleased I, 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 I have been able to do it. Um, I haven't been part of the, uh, of the earlier series of webinars, uh, so I ask Kyle very quickly to brief me very quickly on some of the details uh, of, uh, and he kindly did that. And my understanding was that, well, no, I, this is something I'm familiar with. Of course, uh, the, uh, the Breadfruit people um, was really an idea of um, uh, Bifon wanted to, uh, to include a lot more people. Bifon has been doing uh, quite a bit of work, uh, pharma organizations uh, uh, on Breadfruit, and uh, we wanted to, to talk to other people in the Pacific, particularly the North Pacific people. And uh, according to uh, to Kyle's uh, a brief, uh, the seminar series um, uh, provided a very good opportunity to meet new people and see what they're doing and uh, learn from what they're doing in terms of uh, of growing, producing, and and using uh, breadfruit in many different ways. Uh, the funding, as you know, uh, no, no, I, I mean, as you probably are aware, some of you, um, the EU has uh, funded a five-year uh, project called Pharma for ACP, which stands for uh, 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 Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific. These um uh, associate members of the EU, uh, mostly former colonies, Caribbean and Pacific. So uh, since the formation of the common market, they have had an ongoing uh, relationship with a political and technical relationship uh, with the EU. Oh, you're looking at 70 countries about 50 in Africa, 15 in the uh, Caribbean, and another 12, I think, in the Pacific. Anyway, uh, the funding has been coming through that. There's a project uh, right now, we're in the middle of implementing it. Um, and it's, uh, it's implemented uh, by uh, IFAD, uh, with the assistance of uh, PFON in the Pacific. Anyway, that's where the funding has come from. Um, I also understand that uh, the focus today will be on uh, propagation, maybe even looking at um, some tissue culture on breadfruit, I don't know, but those are some of the details. But I hear from uh, Greg that, um, you know, that we will be looking at systems. And as you know, the Pacific has, uh, has, has systems on breadfruit. I know in Samoa we have our own systems, and um, uh, everywhere else, I'm sure they're all very different, different uh, environment, different soils, different climate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the breadfruit is the same; it's a stable food in the Pacific. And uh, I think um, I think it stands to reason that there is a lot of interest now to try and produce it commercially, food security in the world, and also health reasons. I think it makes a lot of sense the interest and the work that's been done. I'm also aware that, you know, Hawaii uh, and people like Craig have been doing a lot of work on, on breadfruit. So it's very good to have them uh, chair uh, our session today. Uh, I also finally understand that uh, because uh, PFON, as I said, has been working, um, uh, Fiji and Tonga have, uh, have been uh, working on breadfruit in particular. It's a, uh, it's what you call it. It's a, it's a trial uh, period, and I think it's come to an end, funded by uh, ACR, Australian Aid, uh, working uh, with PFON. Anyway, I think, and with the idea that uh, whatever, whatever learning, whatever experiences, whatever knowledge is gained through this uh, trial period, that will be extended to the rest of uh, the PFON members. So I, um, I understand we're going to be looking at some of the work that Tonga and Fiji have, uh, and I certainly look forward to that. Uh, we in Samoa think that we have the best climatic 
soil conditions. I don't know. Craig probably knows about that for bird food. And uh, it grows like uh, like weed here. In fact, it is a weed. You need to rip off the, you know, the ones that, the root systems uh, that grow all over the place. So, uh, but they provide, uh, we talk talking about planting material. They are an excellent source of planting material. Uh, so those are some of the systems that uh, we're going to learn about uh, in Samoa. We uh, we have these. Uh, they they grow the the, the root. The root they just roots all over, and then you you plant them. You just pick them up and grow them again. And uh, so um, with those few remarks, uh, I'm very glad to 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 uh, talk to everybody this morning and uh, to be part of uh, of this discussion. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much for kicking us off in, in such a, a nice way. Um, I appreciate hearing about the background and especially the reminder of the traditional systems which have worked for, for thousands of years uh, in, in breadfruit and propagation of breadfruit. Um, okay, we we'll go to our next uh, presenter then, which is um, very happy to introduce uh, Soane Patolo in Tonga. And uh, Soane is CEO of Mainstreaming of Rural Development Innovation, MORDI for short, in Tonga. And um, he has a very, uh, very impressive resume uh, and um, including having uh, worked in 14 years ago with 22 communities. Uh, and now he's working with 122 communities engaging uh, over almost 40,000 people. So thank you so much for being with us, uh, Soane, and sharing your, your knowledge. Um, and uh, please, we look forward to hearing you. Thank you, Craig. Um, thanks for the introductions. And um, first of all, thanks to the host uh, for the invitation I extended to myself. Um, to present our experience with breadfruit. I um, think uh, everybody on the panel uh, sort of have uh, done some work with them in the past, especially Levi, Carl, Donu, and uh, Afamasanga. I'm always happy to, to see you guys again, um, even though we haven't been connected for a while. Um, similar to Afamasanga, I haven't been uh, very active with the um, breadfruit group, uh, breadfruit people, but I read uh, everything that comes through. Um, for, for this morning, I know I don't have a lot of time. I'll, I'll try to be as quick as I can. I did a, a short presentation. I think with pictures um, speak volumes and me just talking. Um, so I, I'll show um, where, um, Before I got the full invitations, I had a, a short email from Kyle um, asking me to, um, to be one of the presenter. And, and one of the things was obvious was to share our experience with breadfruit um, to be honest, uh, BFON has been uh, a partner that really helped us make uh, bread food uh, important in our activities. Um, so here's a photo that was taken um, when you came over a few years ago, um, Kyle. Uh, we had this bread food uh, in, our, um, uh, in our office and they're about three years old. They start productions already and these are planting from, from suckers. And these are how tall they are. And this was taken this year um, with our queen uh, visiting our, um, our office, um, the lady with the red uh, necklace and the sunglasses. Um, she came over, so she, she spent uh, nearly a whole day with us looking at our activities. And one of the things that was specific here for was looking at our fruit, fruit activities because we um, two productions all the way to uh, processing in which we have different partners, including Nishi, um, trading uh, on, on doing breadfruit flour. Um, glad to hear that Afamasanga claim, uh, Samoan claim that they have the best uh, variety of uh, breadfruit um, similar to us here in Tonga. We always do the same. So everything that is good, we call it Tongan stuff. And then the rest, all the bad stuff, we name it after other Pacific Islands. Uh, so, uh, including Taro and others, and I'm sure Kyle and everybody's smiling, they know what I meant. Um, but with our approach with the, with the short session that I prepared, there's um, 10 things I wanted to cover. 
Uh, we'll talk about the variety that are available here in Tonga, uh, local variety um, that doesn't include varieties that the Longo and her team have been sharing with us. Um, a baseline that sort of guiding us with our work on breadfruit here in Tonga. Uh, propagations, which I know it's the most important topic uh, for this discussion. Uh, the potting, nursery, planting, um, demonstration, and also maintenance and training. And the last one will be uh, looking at the campaign we had with breadfruit. In Tonga, there's only eight varieties of uh, breadfruit. Um, I'm sure everybody else got a name for breadfruit uh, in their own language, but in Tonga, we call uh, breadfruit mei. Um, the first one is Puo, Lotoko, Mefisi, and I'm sure these are all available in other places. But I um, arrange them in a, in a way, um, reflect the result of which one, um, um, when we collected the baseline, uh, people in Tonga uh, treated as the best out of all the eight varieties that we had. So Puo is the first one, Lotoko is the second one, and uh, Mefisi, uh, Mafala, Kea, and also Aveloloa. Um, and then Maupo, Keatala is the last one on the list. Um, we haven't taken into the fine details of um, wh which one, uh, why is Puo number one and why is uh, Keatala is the last one, uh, but that was according to the response given by communities that we interviewed. Uh, moving on to the baseline, um, we started uh, a real work on breadfruit in 2017 uh, with PFON, but also we have other partners, including the Tokyo University of Agriculture um, and also um, University of Sunshine goes through the, uh, um, through the fruit tree initiative. Uh, but these are some of the key findings from that uh, baseline survey we did. We selected um, six communities in the main island of Tongatapu. Uh, we think it's a good uh, representative of all the communities and we did the assessment um, if you look at the graph um, on your top, on the top left, uh, it reflects the um, number of households who have breadfruit either on their home garden or in their bush allotment. Um, and it shows most of um, the household own breadfruit, but it's on the de uh, dex allotment. On the second graph, it reflects that even though there's a lot of household with um, um, breadfruit on their dex allotment, the number of breadfruit in the down allotment is more uh, than the number of breadfruit in the dex allotment. Um, just a, a few highlights. Um, and on the next graph, it's uh, reflecting the number of varieties. And um, the background uh, uh, behind this, it's uh, due to the availability of planting materials or how easy it is to look after um, each variety. Um, we also look at the use, um, the use of breadfruit in the home garden and also at the back, um, the bush allotment, looking at the four things, the waste, gift, sales, and self-consumption. And if you can see uh, in both, um, even though the waste in the down allotment, there's waste there, but there's more waste in the, in the tax allotment uh, or the bush allotment because accessing uh, to get the breadfruit before it's going to waste it's easier on the down allotment than on the push allotment. Um, gifted, um, there's very little sales um, and also um, maturities for self-consumption. The last two graphs I wanted to, to show as part of our um, baseline survey that we did uh, was looking at the uh, good variety for cooking. And this is where I got my list uh, ar arranged the first part of um, um, the breadfruit in, in the, Second page presentation: Puolo, Toko, Mefisi, Mafala, Keave, Loloa, Maupo, and Keatala. And you can uh, see boiling from boiling to fry, and also Faikakai, which is the um, dessert, and also Umu. Um, on the last graph, it shows uh, the respondents who wants to increase number of breadfruit uh, trees. Uh, for both in the town allotment and also in the tax allotment, and it, the numbers look uh, attractive. And that push us or sort of give us directions um, how um, and I mean the propagations and how, mu how much uh, breadfruit we should roll out to, to target communities. Over the years, uh, we have identified six ways of uh, propagations. The first one is suckers, and I, I'm sure everybody else in other Pacific Islands are doing that. 
also we we look at the using the seeds um number three it's um the tissue culture which is uh, linked to cpac and this was done in um 2018 where long on her team where through the um, pacific seeds for life program um, gave us other planting material, but with the May itself, breadfruit, uh, they gave us 15, um, and I think these are Fijian variety of each, the two of them. Um, and we were hoping for some more, but I know long on them have been locked down with COVID, so hopefully soon we'll see some more. Then uh, the fourth one, it's um, cutting, cutting straight of um, the um, breadfruit plants and uh, trying to plant them directly into the ground. Air, air layering, uh, we tried it to have make, make the roots come out um, in the air and then cut it later and plant it. Um, and then number six is grafting. Um, I've jotted down some points, you know, some of the challenge that we have with each. Um, on the suckers, this is the main way of us uh, propagations um, to, to get ready for uh, distributions. And I think most of our uh, of my team, and myself, we think this is the most reliable um, um, method now. Until long, or give us more tissue culture, and I think tissue culture will beat the, the suckers. Um, seeds, um, it's really good. The seeds are really good, but I grow very slowly. Um, and I mean, I was shown on the pictures here. We have from this this year, early season of this year, uh, those. Breadfruit is about six months uh, and it's taking so long uh, to grow. Uh, that was from our collections of this year. Um, similar to um, tissue culture, um, it's also very slow grow um, going to suckers when you, uh, when you do it. Uh, the cutting was a very high percentage of um, unsuccessful um, trial. Uh, air layering, um, to, um, it's, it's more reliable than, than cutting. But uh, again, you have, it's consuming a lot of time and you have to pay attention once you do um, air layering. With the crafting, the crafting itself, um, it's something that we think will help us a lot going for, uh, forward. Um, and it will, I mean, the, um, I think the success or it will grow faster and healthier. The problem is it's, it's an art itself. And I'm, I'm struggling with my team to learn this. We've been having trainings uh, because we're not only looking at crafting breadfruit, but we're also looking at um, crafting other fruit trees uh, for multiplication purpose, uh, including citrus and, and, and others. Um, so those are the six um, methods that we have trialed, but we have learned uh, a seventh uh, method um, through the people breadfruit and I think this was from our friend in Rarotonga, where you get the roots and you chop them up in small pieces and bury them until they come up. Uh, we haven't tried that, but we are planning to do that um, on our next collections of suckers um, for propagation. <clears throat> Just to show how we do it, uh, when, it when we're collecting suckers, um, the process that the team has to go through, collect them from the field and then to a soil shed where we planted the thing into um, plant the bag. Um, same, similar to the tissue culture, when we got it from Longo, we put them on a small pot and then we migrated to another pot. <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, quite, quite a, um, take, takes a while. Um, and they all have uh, different challenges. Um, with, um, but with the suckers, it's the most successful one uh, so far with us. Once we are done with um, planting them into plunder bags, we move them to our nursery. Um, I think um, Levi and Kyle has been to our nursery and um, hopefully some, at some stage soon, I'll have long over to have a look at, um, I, I have a small nursery in our yard that um, can host. Um, our nursery is divided into four sections. We have a, a fruit tree section, so vegetable sections, um, sections for the women, um, flowers, ornamental stuff. Um, and with our fruit trees, uh, it's mainly dominated by breadfruit because of the demand uh, from, from the community itself. <clears throat> Rolling out uh, from planting, collecting uh, planting material to put it in a nursery and roll it out to the community 
we have trial uh, a few uh, ways of um, of um, getting convincing community to plant them. Um, one of the learning that we had over the years, our, our learned a new system um, doesn't really help. Uh, I'm sure with those that are familiar with Tonga, with our tax allotment, uh, majority of us under the law, we only entitled for an eight acres of land um, as a tax allotment. But I mean, that uh, doesn't count people like me who doesn't have a tax allotment. Uh, myself, there's, uh, there's many of us. But for those who have tax allotment, it's really hard for them to plant uh, permanent trees like breadfruit because it, especially if you're doing commercial farming, you need to clear your land and you need um, for, for short term crop stuff. So we tried to find other ways of, um, of putting this planting material that we raise in our nursery. Uh, the pictures that I shows on the presentation here, it's uh, uh, we, with all primary school, we convince them because they have a bigger land uh, given by the government um, to use breadfruit as, our, as their boundary, um, to mark the boundary of the uh, thing, and also to have uh, shade trees for the kids. Um, every year uh, we do this initiative where we plant it and then we go back and monitor and then um, whenever there's, uh, there's a demand, we go back again and plant, even though we planted five or six trees a uh, year, but um, it, it's it's a good thing because we keep adding to our, to our stock. The other way we do planting, um, and this is for the farm itself, um, and it's sort of the same as um, what we do with the primary school, uh, it's mainly to mark boundaries. Uh, so breadfruit has been one of the plants that we recommended to farmers and some farmers have seen it um, is to mark the boundary or divided the, the eight acres into four acres or marking your road. Um, I think uh, with, um, with those that have been here before, we, we try to demonstrate to farmers um, having an orchard style um, through learning from Fiji and other places. And this is from Nishi, um, farm in Waini, in, uh, close to our research station, where we demonstrate uh, doing a, a one acre plot of, um, of May, where he planted three varieties, Mafala, Puo, and Mayfisi, um, and put them all in the one acre plot, um, which is totally new. It's never been done before. That guy is. Um, and it's a uh, it's new, um, but we also do intercropping here to make it more attractive to to farmers. Um, where we planted taro, swamp taro, giant taro, sweet potato, peanuts, and pineapple and other crops together with this uh, one acre plot. Now it's in full production. Uh, the one acre. The good thing is Minoru have more than he leased more than uh, eight acres, so he can afford to give up. Uh, one acre for for this demonstration, but for a lot of our smallholder, they they said they couldn't uh, afford to, to do um, um, an orchard style um, plot, sort of like the one that we put up in Nishi. Um, the more the more attractive uh, uh, style that most farmers are doing, it's following what we have on the demonstrations that we have in our office. Uh, this is an aerial photo of our office and, and our sort of our plantation. Um, where we, the white marks marks our roads. And if you can see the trees around those white marks, those are all breadfruit, um, which including uh, breadfruit that was, um, that was given to us uh, through tissue culture from, from, um, from CPAC. Uh, we also trying to intercrop others, uh, like plant them together with pale and moringa, Vetiva and popo and, and other crops. Um, but it, it can show uh, we have about 200 trees in our yard, uh, even though it's just to mark the road, but it, it, um, it's quite a lot. And we've start, it start production, full production this year, and we have seen a good deal coming out. But this is a model that uh, it's, uh, we have found out it's more attractive to farmers um, than an orchard uh, method. Um, so we're still learning and trying to see if we could roll out more uh, orchard model because the orchard, I think, is the key uh, if we want to participate on trade and also trying to um, 
to share that with, um, I mean, to export them to um, overseas. Um, some photos from um, maintenance. Uh, when we do home gardening, a lot of, uh, one of the things that we learn, uh, a lot of um, household doesn't want fresh fruit trees in their, in, in their home because of the size and then um, the threat it posed on, on the houses um, when, when there's a tropical cyclone. Um, but through pruning and maintaining the heights of the uh, trees, we think it's a, it's a best way to convince um, household owners to plant in breadfruit. And we do this with a big demonstration in our, in our, um, um, in our yard in the office. And this shows a, a training. Uh, they've been contacted um, by us, um, to community members, but also to our team. When all of our breadfruit trees in our office is not more than two meters long, and they're, but they're heavily pruned every now and then. We also advertise this method as a way of um, trying to make uh, our breadfruit resilient to, um, to cyclone um, if uh, there's any coming because of the heights uh, and potentially because of airflow. Um, with good um, pruning, uh, it might save the trees uh, when there's a strong wind comes. Uh, we have also in our effort um, to promote the breadfruit, we have developed our own guide. And this is both in English and in Tongan, and we're on the final stage of testing it uh, before we final publish it and, and giving it out to farmers. And there's uh, 11 things that we cover under this um, um, guide. Where the plant, the descriptions of the May, uh, the cultivars that we have here in Tonga, uh, the climatic uh, requirements for May, um, site selections if farmers, uh, both on the decks allotment and also on the home garden. Uh, propagations, we, as I mentioned, we all describe how we do propagations here, different ways, and also uh, provided pro and cons so farmers can decide later which one to use. Um, best and disease, the yield, harvesting, trading, and quality control, uh, market preparations and storage, and also the uses of breadfruit. Um, and this covers on the, um, um, the kite that we have developed over the years as part of our um, trying to teach farmers um, about breadfruit. Um, I want to, tell, to share a story, and this was from um, when we roll out our fruit tree program uh, uh, with the University of Sunshine Coast, um, but also with, with our other partners. And, and through that, we have um, breadfruit as one of them. We took them out to one of our community in the outer island. Um, when we started the, uh, the meeting, I explained to them about the fruit trees. And one old man in the meeting stood up and said, uh, why do we, you come here and hassle us to plant all these trees? For many years, the birds have been planting all our citrus, our breadfruit uh, suddenly grow by itself and, and other fruit trees. And so uh, doing this, trying to plant breadfruit, it's, it's something a little bit new, especially with uh, the maintenance, pruning and doing all that stuff and teaching them about the pests and disease. These are all new things to most of our communities and most of our farmers. And it's, uh, as we all know, new things always take time to get through. So I'm not praising that we're doing a, a, a very good job right now, but I think give us more years and uh, I think we can start tapping our shoulder and saying that we're doing a good job. Um, we've been having um, this um, um, dream or um, initiative we set up and this was done um, in, um, sort of parallel to what we're currently doing. Um, currently, we're, we are implementing an EFAT project in Tonga. Uh, and I think it's the biggest agriculture initiative uh, for, the, for the island itself. And it covers 122, um, as mentioned by Craig earlier. And um, it do a lot of things on agriculture space. And where it's focusing on home garden, uh, how to improve that, and also tax allotment. And we have this dream that... Um, by the end of the project in 2024, if we can have at least five fruit trees in every household in Tonga, either was planted by themselves or we contribute to that through the project, um, but have May is one of them. And then to teach them how, um, how to, 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 um, to plant them and also how to look after them. And 
uh, on our other initiative like uh, flour making and also cooking and other things can add on later on. But this is our target. In Tongatapu alone, we are we're targeting um, to have about 3,000 households with five fruit trees and um, you know, one of them is spread fruit. Um, it might look low here, but I mean, this is the aim, look at one, but potentially um, they might need it also some of their dex allotment. They might need it uh, maybe one or two or three, uh, who knows. But these are target as, as for now, and we have been working on this since 2017. Um, and the numbers looks good uh, as move forward. Um, I'll, I'll show you another slide. Um, the rate of distribution just this year, um, even though it's very slowly in one island, but we tag every new breadfruit that we plant into the ground in each household. And you can ask me and I can tell you where was the last breadfruit we planted last month. Even my boys are out now in some of our community in the main island of Tomatapu to do the fruit tree initiative. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping by 2024, uh, 2023, we will have uh, reached all our target and potentially, hopefully, will be more than that. Uh, just to show how we track all our breadfruit, all our initiative on the ground, especially breadfruit. Um, this is only for um, this year alone. Uh, the data that just quickly pull out by our team uh, for, for this meeting. Um, to show some. Um, um, trees where it's located either on a text allotment or a tunnel. These are summary map, but we have all the data set um, by household, who owns the household and all that stuff. Um, and for just for this year alone, on the, only on the island of Tongatapu, we have planted about 988 um, breadfruit trees. Um, Similar to the introduction that was done um, earlier, I think it's also important that we uh, acknowledge the partners that uh, make all of this uh, work um, looks good uh, to present today. Um, our government, IFAD, FAO, um, then of Japan, um, with PFON, um, Pacific Seeds for Life, SBC, University of Sunshine Coast, and Nishi Trading. Um, and if you want to read more about the work that we do on breadfruit, uh, we also have our social media. Um, you can go into our Facebook, uh, Instagram, or Twitter. And we also have a few videos. Um, and soon will be a lot of videos on training on, on breadfruit coming up soon. Malo Albito, back to you, Greg. Yes, thank you so much, Soane, for such a rich uh, presentation. So much, in, so much going on I had no idea about. That I, Greatly appreciate that. And I'm sure um, some of our participants may have questions. Just reminding participants to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. It says Q&A and just type them in there and we'll handle them after, after all of the speakers have concluded. Okay, we'll move on to our next presenter. Um, we have, we're very fortunate to have uh, Longo Waganabete from uh, Fiji, who will be, I mean, sorry, sorry from Samoa, um, who will be uh, presenting on tissue culture propagation. And um, Longo works with the Genetic Resources Program uh, on advancing regional, national, and community capacity in the conservation, development, and utilization of plant genetic resources. Longo has been working for over 13 years as a curator uh, for the gene bank. So um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Longo here to speak with, uh, on this topic. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Greg, and also uh, to my uh, colleague Soane for that wonderful presentation. And yes, my uh, special thanks also to the organizers for the opportunity given to us to share our own experiences around uh, the different methodologies we are also currently using at CPEC as our Pacific Regional Gene Bank uh, in terms of propagating uh, breadfruit. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, move on to the next slide. I thought I'd, I'd start off with a quick introduction about the uh, CPEC. 
Uh, for the information of our listeners uh, joining in that may not be fully aware of the Gene Bank, so CPACT was established in 1998 uh, as SPC's response to uh, the Pacific's recommendation in 1996 to support uh, the conservation and utilization of important plant genetic resources in our region. And in addition to CPAC, uh, Pacific Island Tree Seed Center was also established by SPC in 2011 to focus on the conservation and management of forest genetic resources. And this uh, Tree Seed Center has, in 2020, was integrated with CPAC under our uh, CPAC's new business plan and, um, and an initiative that was also fully supported by our member countries. Uh, CPAC, so when I uh, talk CPAC now, it's no longer just CPAC that usually focuses on just uh, crops for agriculture, food for food only, but also uh, the center now incorporates forest uh, tree genetic resources. CPAC's main objective uh, is to sustainably conserve and utilize plant genetic resources using innovative uh, methodologies, crop improvement activities and germplasm exchange on both regional and global levels. Uh, the center has two critical functions in supporting in, uh, the improvement of food and nutritional security and building resilience to climate change. So just to give a summary of uh, all our conservation and distribution, crop distribution activities, we have over 2,000 accessions of 56 food crops and forest tree species. 66% uh, of these are originated from the Pacific. 94 of uh, all the accessions are conserved in tissue culture. 3% as seeds and 1% in the field. And this is uh, uh, comprised of our breadfruit collection, the only uh, crop that we have in the field. Uh, and the last... Uh, 15 years or so, we have distributed over 80,000 tissue culture plants of 16 crops. And with the uh, addition of the uh, forest tree seed center, we have also distributed around 1,000 kilograms of seeds of mainly uh, two species. We have distributed plant materials to over 50 countries worldwide and covering all the 22 uh, Pacific Islands as members of SBC. Um, yes, uh, under the new uh, land resources uh, business plan, our work is more now streamlined into the work of LRD. And you have heard Soane mention the Pacific Seeds for Life program, where we're now working across the division to provide materials under different projects for the purpose of supporting uh, food and nutrition security and climate uh, resilience. So now talking about breadfruit, uh, we have distributed over 3,000 tissue culture plants as well as potted breadfruit plants. Obviously the potted plants are, is only for Fiji. In the past uh, 10 years and comprising of 14 varieties to 18 countries. So I've listed the countries there, 15 BICTs, American Samoa, Fiji, FSM, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Palau, Samoa, Tokelau, Tonga, Tuvalu, Wallis, and Futuna. And then, of course, we've sent them across to Norfolk Island as well as all the way to the Caribbean in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So uh, I was asked uh, for the purpose of my talk uh, in this uh, webinar was to really look at the systems rather than talking about the tissue culture propagation uh, process itself. So uh, I was asked to perhaps uh, provide an overview of uh, the advantages and disadvantages of plant tissue culture as one of the propagation methods for breadfruit. So uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of plant tissue culture. There's a, a lot of uh, publications available online that also highlight some of these things that I've mentioned here. Uh, but there are some few exceptions from our own uh, experience here in the center. And so the advantages of plant tissue culture, it's a fast method to multiply plants and it can, uh, if you operate it well, you can produce up to thousands or millions per month. 
Uh, it's also a, a good method to produce plants all year round. Uh, it's not really dependent on the seasons as uh, it would be with conventional methods. And uh, it also requires a very small amount of uh, space, as a small amount of the initial plant tissue for the propagation. So uh, for example, we can just use one or two uh, shoot tips from one variety and uh, can generate thousands from those just two uh, shoot tips. And then it also, uh, it relatively uses a small space, uh, not only to for the process itself to produce the material, but also to store them. So uh, the 2000 accessions I mentioned is only stored in one small room about four, four by four uh, meters. Uh, in. So that's, if you put this uh, 2000 plants in the field, I'm sure it will take up a whole lot more acres than, uh, than just this small room that we have them here in the center. So another uh, unique advantage of uh, plant, uh, plant tissue culture is it can produce uniform plants. And this would be a, a, a good uh, advantage specifically for commercial, uh, to produce for, uh, targeted for commercial uh, targeted varieties if you, if you want to produce uh, uniform plants. And then it also uh, facilitates the safe exchange of plant materials across borders. So for the role of CPEC, because we are a regional gene bank and our role is to make sure that the material, that the collections we have are put to good use and uh, uh, countries are accessible to them. We have this role to uh, share materials across borders. So we can't uh, share materials uh, like vegetative uh, plant materials because of biosecurity concerns. So tissue culture provides the means for safe exchange of these materials across. So it is a unique uh, uh, method for us in that sense. Um, it's also for us and for our own purposes around the long-term conservation of our Pacific important crops. It's an important requisite for other biotechnological uh, applications like a virus indexing, we do carry out virus indexing and virus elimination if a virus is found in one of the varieties because uh, the plants we use for these processes are firstly derived from tissue culture. And then of course, cryopreservation, which is also one of the key area that the center is now putting a lot of focus on for the long-term uh, conservation of our uh, crop collections that we currently have. Um, also looking at from, from a, a genetic uh, point of view, most of the crops that we are dealing with here are, are crops that are clonally propagated or, and also unorthodox uh, forestry species. So ideally, uh, like for example, uh, for seed conservation, it's very easy to conserve seeds, very easy to also have, uh, maybe also have field collections. Uh, in the long term, we're looking 20, 30, 50 years in future. But when you look at clonally propagated crops, it's quite hard to conserve them using seeds or uh, even field collections for us here in the, in the SBC. So for us, uh, tissue culture is one of the uh, advantage for us to uh, really, uh, it suits the kind of crops that we are dealing with. Unlike most other international gene banks that deal, for example, with rice. Rice is very easy because you can just conserve rice seeds. But for us dealing with clonally propagated crops like breadfruit, taro, banana, it is uh, very useful for us to have uh, plant tissue culture as one of the methodologies for our conservation uh, and distribution work. So in terms of the disadvantages, uh, of course, the first one up will be, it is a, it's a very expensive method, not only in terms of uh, establishment, but running the continuous running of the facility. So we're looking at infrastructure costs. Uh, for example, I, I can give you our own example. For CPEC, it was, uh, uh, we, the, the facility we now have was established uh, with a total cost of uh, 900,000 uh, Australian dollars. And uh, it is also, uh, well, that is only the infrastructure. It doesn't include all the equipments, all the consumables, uh, and the human resources costs. 
which I can, uh, uh, we did a, a quick um, review in 2017 of our running, the running costs only. We, it was estimated by our finance uh, uh, division around 1.3 million Fijian dollars per year just to keep the facility running, which means that it excludes the infrastructure or the capital costs. That is just the running costs. So you can see it's, it's a very, very expensive uh, facility to run and to maintain over the years. So it's, it's, it also requires highly specialized equipment and some of which, uh, well, I'm glad now uh, we see the trend now that we have a lot, uh, a lot more suppliers uh, producing equipment that for tissue culture. But before in the previous years, it's very hard to find suppliers that produce uh, tissue culture equipment. So because of this uh, uh, variety of suppliers now available, uh, the costs of equipment are starting to come down a bit now. I, I take, for example, a laminar airflow that used to cost us 7,000 Australian dollars for one. In five years ago, it is now only costing us uh, 2,000 USD uh, for one, uh, just, uh, just uh, 2020. Another disadvantage uh, also is Oh yes, still with the with the the costs uh, uh, aspect, we also have very high electricity and uh, water utility costs. So for us, uh, we have around nine thousand to ten thousand uh, Fiji dollars uh, bill every year, and we also have around uh, three thousand uh, Fiji dollars uh, water bills uh, yeah, on an annual basis. So it keeps going up. So those are uh, uh, some of the costs uh, that are involved with establishing this kind of uh, facilities is quite quite high. And then of course, uh, with with uh, it's it is a very labor intensive process. We need a whole lot of uh, staff to constantly monitor, uh, propagate the, the material, and this labor also needs uh, needs to be highly specialized and trained. So it is uh, quite uh, a cost for us to maintain these lab this uh, staffs uh, year in and year out, and it's uh, uh, one of the key challenges that we are we have been facing is trying to look for money to secure uh, these highly qualified staffs. So uh, another disadvantage of plant tissue culture that is also, uh, well, perhaps it's not very common. If you have your protocols right and your procedures right, you can easily avoid this disadvantage and that is somaclonal variation. And, uh, it, and this is mostly uh, caused by the use of uh, uh, what you call hormones in the culture media that we use to propagate plants. So if you come up with a media uh, formulation for plants that can uh, avoid the use uh, of hormones, you are uh, done away with this uh, issue of somaclonal variation. Um, I'm glad to report that uh, most of our procedures, we hardly, we try our best to uh, get away from using a lot of uh, hormones. So we uh, try to maintain the purity of each uh, material that we produce. Um, one of the disadvantages a disadvantage of this method is that it may need also investment in uh, research for establishment of protocols for each crop. So if you have a crop that you want to mass propagate, but it hasn't been put into tissue culture and no one else in the world has developed, has, has also put it in tissue culture, you will need to put some bit of research to develop the protocol to establish that plant material into tissue culture. And that's also another uh, it can also be another uh, expensive exercise because there are so many other, uh, so many procedures involved when you uh, establish a tissue culture protocol, right from initiation to uh, putting it back into the field and make sure that it grows up as the same uh, plant that you want it to be. Another one that we foresee from our own side is it may require some investment in acclimatization facilities, some greenhouse to put the materials in first before it goes to the field. Because as you all know, these materials have been confined for so long, they need a bit of acclimatization phase first before they go to the field. And while some countries have established uh, uh, 
good uh, greenhouse facilities to uh, acclimatize some of the materials they get from us. Some are also uh, uh, improvising with, uh, you know, those uh, simple um, using just timber and cover with coconut fronts uh, kind of uh, outside greenhouses, which also um, uh, is also ideal. As long as they are put in a, a shade and a bit more cool environment to allow them to adjust to their uh, outside environment. So just to wrap it up and uh, some quick recommendations from my side. I mean, for commercial purposes, uh, for me, I, tissue culture would be very ideal as a potential return on investment can be, uh, the potential return on investment can be guaranteed. That is if all your procedures, all your uh, are in place and are, are rightly done. You can easily get uh, a good uh, return on the investment you have made. Um, there are also uh, small scale tissue culture labs that exist uh, in other places in the world. I take, for example, um, Taiwan. Taiwan uh, is one of the key producers of Cavendish for uh, the international market. And I visited the banana, uh, Taiwan Banana uh, Tissue Culture Lab there. They have a very small facility that can produce, uh, that produces one to two million uh, banana uh, plantlets per month. And from this facility, it serves all the, the farmers, uh, folk farmers in the, in the banana network in Taiwan, which I think is a very good model, quite different from CPAC because our own uh, purpose is a bit different from Taiwan. They just produce purely for the market. And they only focus on one variety of one crop. For CPAC, we are focusing on 18 crops with 2,000 something, uh, 2,000 and more than 2,000 accessions. So you can uh, uh, easily see the difference. So for me, I think uh, it can work, but it doesn't need to be as big as CPAC. There are also alternatives for small scale tissue culture labs that can uh, use for the purpose of uh, producing as many hundreds or thousands of plants per month, if uh, someone would consider this for the production of breadfruit. So yes, uh, for breadfruit, I, yeah, it can be ideal for orchard development, although I think uh, um, there are other alternatives. I'm sure you've heard from Soane's presentation. There's uh, mock orchard plantlets, there's root cuttings, there's seeds. So those are also alternatives and perhaps uh, it might be best to find out a strategy on how we can combine all the methods. Uh, perhaps tissue culture can, can just come in, in the initial phase of accessing varieties and then further propagation, you can also explore other uh, methods that Soane uh, has identified. If you see from Soane's uh, experience, uh, you hear from ex Soane's experience, tissue culture plants are very slow to grow in the field. So it might be best for you to go for the more potted ones or also the, uh, uh, the crafted uh, methodologies. And um, one of the uh, experiences we have in our region is that most of the tissue culture labs that most of our, uh, some of our countries have established are not really uh, working as, as uh, they would have expected. And simply because I take the example of uh, Fiji uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture, with SBC supported the establishment of the tissue culture lab there in 2015. And up to now, it's still not producing the number of plantlets that they would ideally need to be produced from their tissue culture uh, a lab. And uh, there's some not only infrastructural issues, but there are also, I think there's, uh, there's a need also to look at uh, maintaining uh, tissue culture staff. Because uh, as you know, uh, we keep training staffs over time. But sometimes these staffs are put in, uh, in other places besides tissue culture labs. So it doesn't really uh, end up with uh, producing a, a good result in the end. So I think that's all from my side, Greg. And I am happy to answer any more questions. I just don't want to go over my time. And I'm aware that there's also other speakers after me. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Longo. That was really brilliant um, introduction to the topic. And thank you for sharing your deep experience on this. Really, um, really wonderful. So um, now we turn to our last speaker, um, who is Levi Tora. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of him or met him. He is a commercial farmer. He's a trainer and um, a much beloved member of every community he visits. So we're very lucky to have Levi. Um, I guess he's in the PFON office right now. Um, and he'll be speaking on uh, propagation of breadfruit in Fiji. So um, welcome, Levi. Um, thank you, Craig. Um, I guess we'll just get straight into it. Um, so we'd like to share with the listeners and uh, the panelists uh, uh, our experience of um, uh, collecting uh, breadfruit planting material for um, to basically develop a cottage industry and commercial industry. Uh, so, just a bit of background, this, um, this project was, uh, uh, was actually uh, an OSCADE uh, project um, funded by ACR, Australian Center for International Agricultural Research. Uh, it was a four-year project that was run um, several years ago. And uh, so, uh, basically, a team of experts got together uh, in the country, uh, reps from the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, the private uh, private sector and it is very cooperative. Um, we had um, uh, the people, the guys from uh, CPEC, SPC, Long and crew. Uh, we also had farmers. We had exporters. Uh, we also had nurserymen. So basically, everybody along the the breadfruit um, uh, supply chain or value chain. And um, we were had to prioritize uh, activities for this uh, particular project. Um, so we had uh, one of the most important uh, um, objectives was how we were going to uh, propagate uh, uh, breadfruit planting material. Uh, after initial uh, survey on the islands in Levan uh, Vololeu, we found out that uh, uh, material, a lot of material existed uh, in the, the second largest island, which was Vololeu. And uh, so we need an um, uh, in an attempt to try and uh, uh, source our, uh, our material from there initially. So while we were doing it, um, CPAC was working in parallel. Their job was to basically uh, mass propagate these uh, different varieties. And they were going to provide a project with this material, and we were going to uh, establish some. And uh, in that period, we were, we were going to monitor these trees. And, uh, and, uh, and observe them and um, set up uh, um, uh, tunnels uh, to try and identify which varieties uh, would better suit our conditions here in the, the western side of, uh, of the country, which was uh, Nandi. So some of the key findings from the, from the collection and mass propagation of this uh, was, of course, you had to facilitate the farmers. A lot of the farmers in the cane belt, uh, you know, they were keen uh, to plant breadfruit. Uh, but apart from that, they, we did not have the information of uh, which particular variety uh, the market wanted. So we uh, came up with this uh, ambitious target of uh, uh, trying to source 2,000 breadfruit trees of a commercial uh, orchard establishment. And we, we worked with the um, uh, Minister of Agriculture. We worked with CPAT and uh, the farmers uh, themselves in setting up a sort of a network and uh, to try and uh, establish this uh, project. So the initial strategy was, okay, let's go around the country and uh, let's do some markets. And um, when we started in the western side of Italy, we, it, uh, it just came to our attention that uh, uh, the most prominent uh, uh, variety that existed in the western side was the seed varieties. And for our market overseas, uh, they basically wanted um, the seedless variety. And um, because we, we represented the um, uh, private sector, uh, it was in our business interest to uh, identify a variety that our market wanted that we could supply. So, so very quickly, we changed our strategy and said we have to look uh, for this uh, particular variety, which is Mbalakana, 
slash mafala, which is the, um, the Samuel variety. And um, apart from this, we also had a, um, uh, an extension officer uh, that worked with us, Kate Yarosito, who was also uh, working uh, with us very closely to, uh, to characterize some of these varieties. So before all this, now I'm going back again, there was a literature, uh, literature survey done. Uh, we tried to capture all the literature that we could, uh, trying to uh, document uh, whatever has been done out there. And a lot of the work at that, that time was being done in the Caribbean. So we tried to uh, uh, look at the lessons learned and try to uh, tailor it to our uh, conditions. So by going back to looking uh, for these varieties, we uh, and uh, we try to uh, source some other varieties uh, from these uh, specific hotspots because we have just a lot of uh, varieties. Yeah. If you can see in this slide, um, there's a lot of um, dead markets there. Uh, you have a few of the boys uh, attempting to do markets. Uh, this this was sort of our, our, our orientation period. Eh? We really didn't know what we were doing at that point. Um, whether it was going to be Makot, whether it was going to be Tishwasa or Rutsakas. So we were trying out all these, um, all these propagation systems. Uh, so you can see Ashni on your right here, a uh, very dedicated worker. She worked closely with us, uh, giving us a lot of information uh, on what they were doing at CPEC at the same time. And uh, at the bottom there, you'll see uh, the team there with uh, Valerie and Ashni. Uh, those are some of the trees we took from CPEC to go and plant uh, on the ground eh? and uh, monitor them. And those are some of the, um, the plants we uh, were able to get from, uh, um, from feedback. So the results from our initial studies was uh, root suckers from uh, vitilehu and wild trees uh, was very difficult. Eh? And uh, the only variety that was uh, dominant was the utundina. Uh, difficult to access and we had uh, lots of uh, land issues. Uh, we were going through other people's farms so it was a bit of a sensitive uh, area. Eh? Uh, and of course, trying to convince the farmers themselves, sugarcane farmers, to plant breadfruit. Uh, you know, and, and the villages. Uh, the, some of the first uh, responses we got from them were, why do we have to plant a breadfruit when we've got um, a lot of breadfruits already in the, in the village and in our plantations? Eh? So we were basically uh, hitting a brick wall with trying to convince farmers to plant. And as you can see, our markets, that we did in the western side of Itila, we were successfully, it was just like four from the 1,000. Uh, root suckers from the 2,000 that we planted, 800. Um, I've also said, also uh, mentioned in my previous um, uh, webinar, uh, you know, th these are very important results. Eh? Uh, people think that uh, it was a waste of time trying to do this uh, mark cutting exercise, and uh, we got criticized for it because um, there was a lot of literature that was already out Okay, I'm showing us how to do properly. But uh, what was not there was uh, the result that you'll have different results in different geographical locations. That was the that was the trick there. And here we are trying to mark out breadfruit trees in the western side of uh, Vitile. If, if you know um, Nandi, uh, it's a very, very uh, dry, uh, dry zone. Eh? So Nandi is a dry zone going up north, right up to Ra. And in the center there, the Singatoka, sort of the intermediate zone. They get a, a bit of rainfall and uh, you know uh, really good uh, optimal conditions. And then as you go further east, uh, that's where you have uh, some of your, uh, the, the most optimum um, weather conditions for planting breadfruit because you have a uh, constant rain. Eh? And um, one of the lessons that you learned was uh, you have to mark out during the rainy season in the Nandi area uh, because it's, it's, it's helps uh, uh, boost the root system. And also, you are, what you're basically doing for marketing is you're tricking the plant. Yeah? So when you are trying to, uh, the, the, the branch that you've marketed is still trying to source its energy from the, from the whole tree. Now it's trying to source its energy from the, um, uh, from the, the material that we've uh, wrapped, it, uh, wrapped it with. And so if, you, if there's any optimal conditions like, uh, you know, uh, moisture and temperature and humidity, affects the results at the end of the day. So you can see that uh, we got a lot of uh, mortality rates 
but it was a really good lesson for us. Yeah? You have to mark out during the rainy season in the West, and uh, you have to be very selective with the varieties. For the rootstock, it's a different story again. Um, mixed uh, results, we got about 800 initially. Uh, you know, for, uh, for, for us trying to do that for the first time, uh, it was a big learning curve. Eh? Uh, we had sort of uh, sorted out the plant material to be small, medium, and large. And we found out that uh, the larger the material with more roots, uh, they took uh, better uh, opposed to um, roots that were sort of medium sized, had no roots, and smaller, thinner uh, sized uh, planting material. So the lesson from there was always select uh, planting material that's, that's quite, um, that's sort of your, that's sort of like three, four feet uh, from the ground. Uh, try and maintain a lot of roots and um, make sure you, you prune your, your roots as well prior to planting. And it'll also help if uh, you can uh, soak these uh, root suckers in um, root hormone, uh, root hormone. Yeah? So it can um, basically initiate uh, uh, rooting. And so these are some of the lessons uh, we learned. Uh, a lot of mortality rates, but uh, like I said, eh, this was the kind of information that you wanted and it's well documented. And uh, if people were gonna do the same thing, they could learn um, from uh, what we did. Eh? So. Now the direction was sort of like the focus went on to okay, you know let's let's look at tissue culture as a, as the as a, the alternative. So small amounts uh, of um, of uh, root suckers and markers, plus there was no uh, commercial TC lab in Fiji uh, at that point in time. CPEC, uh, the the um, the activities are totally different. They uh, they work a lot with research. Eh? And for a commercial farmer to try and access uh, planting material, um, it'll be good for them to come from a, a project rather than, uh, than going straight to seed uh, bed. Uh, that's how I understand it, eh? because they are, they're trying to supply uh, a whole lot of uh, people, a lot of farmers. So some of the planting material uh, from CPET. Um, so at one, one side, we were uh, one team were working out in the field. And on the other end, in Suva, uh, we had Sipak Lomo, uh, Valerie, and the team uh, trying to uh, propagate uh, uh, breadfruit tissue uh, culture material. And um, those were the results. I mean, when she talks about uniformity, it's very important for commercial uh, breadfruit uh, production. Uh, you look at the pictures at the bottom, eh? uh, different size branches, because there are branches. Eh? I mean, they're not supposed to be trees. And we've basically checked them. We've planted them in pots, and uh, you, you can see, I mean, there's no uniformity there. Different sizes, uh, different lengths. So when you are going to plant these trees versus those trees at the top, you will see the big difference uh, in uh, time of uh, flowering, in time of fruiting, um, you know, just general orchard management will be very difficult. So as we were doing this work in the field, uh, um, in hindsight, we're always uh, looking forward to uh, getting this appointment from CIPA to see how we will do um, in the field, opposed to uh, the work, uh, the planning material that you were getting from, um, from the villages. Eh? So, um, because we had, um, we were prone to cyclones and flooding, um, we were able to establish these uh, orchards I mean, sorry, not what it's, uh, these uh, nurseries. And then, and then, then the question came, uh, what was the best way to implement these uh, nurseries? Do you need a commercial uh, orchard uh, nursery, uh, which is uh, fully mechanized, uh, sprinkler system, uh, you know, the works there? Yeah? Or uh, could we just use uh, um, locally sourced materials, which is what you see there? Uh, bamboo structure with the uh, coconut leaves. And uh, that was our first go at it. Eh? And uh, all of this uh, went through a, a flood uh, at, the, uh, at the initial stages of our project, and we lost most of our material. Eh? Uh, but again, lessons learned. Eh? Uh, don't try and build your nest beside the river. It floods once a year. One. Uh, two, uh, make sure that um, the uh, material size 
in both uh, medium length and lot of roots. And um, three, make sure that you use sterilized uh, potting media as well. Uh, as you know, you 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 taking up this plant material and uh, you come to um, you plant it out in a sort of a, a rough makeup uh, nursery, and then you still uh, prone to the elements, yeah, the heat, uh, the sun. So mortality rate again very very high. Uh, but like I said, it was well documented. You know, if you're going to do this again, please uh, just watch out. Uh, these are the parameters uh, you have to watch out for. Eh? And uh, just making sure that uh, if someone were to do it commercially, uh, just um, be prepared for the next cyclone and the next flood. Because uh, a lot of effort and a lot of effort is going to be the way that into it. But uh, as you hear, it's uh, sweet. You know, the, the most important things that came out of this project were the lessons learned. Yeah? So if I were to do this again, make sure I'd, I'd have a, a cycling a mitigation nursery where uh, if there's a cycle that comes in uh, at any point in time, I could just open these containers, shove this uh, planting material in, close it, cyclone comes after 24, 12, uh, 12, 24 hours, open it up again, your material is safe. Uh, so that's just a warning uh, to people uh, or farmers or commercial uh, investors who want to get into uh, uh, large scale uh, co commercial breadfruit uh, farming eh? or nursery systems. Uh, make sure you have somewhere safe to uh, put it in when, uh, when a cyclone does uh, come. So you don't go through, go through the experience that we experienced and we lost, I think, 95% um, of, uh, of all the work that we did. Eh? Mm -hmm. Those are some of the uh, planning material that we brought down um, just prior to the, um, I mean, sorry, just after the last year, we were to uh, sell with some, and uh, as you can see, now there are no leaves, eh? so we basically pick them up from the debris, wash them, clean them, uh, cut the, 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 the dead uh, parts, and we try to report them again. Eh? And um, these were all, again, very well documented. Eh? We just tried to see whether they would uh, recover. Eh? Uh, but the recovery rate was very slow. And again, high mortality post, uh, post flood. So our second strategy, um, we got uh, information from our, from our, from our context. Uh, to the Ministry of Agriculture and of course the rural uh, training center uh, that um, the preferred variety that we were looking for uh, there was a lot in the second island of Fiji of Onoleu and uh, interviewed so because we had a, a, a good relationship with the Tutu rural training center we we um, we, we got to uh, use them so our, 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 our contact on the ground uh, to source our planting material. And they were actually the ones that took us around to all these villages. Eh? And we were, we were so indebted to uh, Tutu Rojain Center for opening up um, um, their, their network with us and sharing with us all this uh, planting material uh, that we were going to get. And uh, at the same time, our plan was to um, establish village uh, nurseries. So apart from uh, trying to source root suckers, okay, we were, uh, we were uh, our thinking that time, why don't we just train the villages themselves, let them pot at source, and we purchase from there. So that was sort of our, our second strategy. So as you can see from the map, this is the one level map, and um, we've marked out there the, the places that we sourced our, uh, our bread from. Um, that's along the um, the Nateo Peninsula, they call it, eh? and this is these are the hotspots for Mbala kind of variety, the preferred variety that we want. Uh, if you go back to our our market survey, uh, we we know for for a fact that uh, or most of our fresh uh, breadfruit that we send overseas goes to the Samoan community, uh, and they want fresh Mbala kana. and um, this is why we zoom down to this particular variety. It said, okay, let's um, let's look for the preferred variety and let's try and mass propagate the variety. So these are the villages that supplied us with uh, those varieties. Eh? 
we work with the tutorial training center, they took, uh, took us there. We, apart from collecting plant material, we also try to uh, uh, do a lot of uh, awareness with the villages. Eh? So we, we had a lot of um, uh, training that was done uh, uh, in the villages, all these villages. We also try to encourage these villages to uh, start planting um, uh, breadfruit uh, to earn a sort of um, a side business, eh? because there's so much uh, planting material around. So the next thing was to establish small nurseries and try and get these women's groups and youth groups to plant uh, breadfruit on a, on a mini scale. So if we, I mean, in the future, we wouldn't have to source uh, bare root plant material, we just source uh, plants from, from them. Eh? That was sort of the thinking at that point. So, uh, so these are some of the pictures us sourcing out from the villages. As you can see, the different size of planting material, uh, like I said, at that point in time, in time we really didn't know what, uh, what was the best size planting material we needed to, um, to plant uh, breadfruit. Eh? Was it going to be the large? Was it going to be the medium? Was it going to be the small? Uh, so as you can see, all sorts of sizes. Eh? But you know, we had a lot of fun. Um, we purchased uh, these uh, breadfruit material for, I think, 50 cents for one circus and um, it was uh, earning these farmers, these landowners, uh, a lot of money at that point in time. Eh? I think we sourced more than 20,000 or 30,000 root suckers from these guys. And they were, they were really happy with uh, the deal we made with them. And we, we made sure that we would always um, acknowledge them <clears throat> when we were um, establishing the farms. And um, like Aswani was had mentioned, we, in order to uh, work out a, a traceability uh, a sort of a pathway, we, we make sure that we record and document where we source them, how many we source, uh, what particular size range, and also the people that source with us, date, time, and um, all these suckers were tagged. And we made, and so now we'll go, uh, we, I can go out to any of these orchards and I could um, tell people. This is where we source these materials from. Eh? And, uh, so that was one important uh, part, uh, trying to uh, document uh, where this uh, planting material was coming from. And uh, of course, the end result was monitoring these trees uh, out in the field back in Nandi. So these are some of the things from the planting material in the river. And then another strategy was working with the two tutorial training center. Uh, we felt that. Um, it was uh, still a big risk working with the resource owners and landowners. Um, it was a bit of 50-50 because uh, of the, I mean, you had to basically look after these plants. Eh? And um, a lot of the, uh, the farmers in the village uh, uh, didn't have the capability to look after their, their nurses at that point in time. So we said, okay, why don't we work with um, the Tutu Rural Training Center? And they were really, really good, you know. Um, we, we, we trained the, the ladies there, we trained the, the young farmers there, how to map out, as you can see the pictures. You know, we, we had really, really good results and uh, they put a lot of our breadfruit. And so we had this problem of trying to bring this breadfruit back to Nandi. And uh, very, very important exercise because, okay, let's, let's, um, let's try and do the feasibility, yeah? Uh, whether it works or doesn't work or whether it's uh, too expensive or, or not viable at all. Yeah? So once we had uh, the stock in place, we had a lot of brief plant material, we had markets to bring, and um, there, were, there were three ways to go about it. You could either send it by boat, a sea freight from Tavimi down to Nandi, uh, down to uh, Vitileu, or you can, um, you can use, you can go via a plane, air freight. Yeah? And uh, so we were sort of uh, trying to uh, test out uh, which one was the, the, the better route. Yeah? And then of course, yeah, these are some of the pictures back in the field. Uh, uh, Ashni, you can see there, the whole team were working together. Eh? Ministry of Agriculture, the guys from um, uh, Senganga, and uh, the farmers themselves, the villages, and uh, showing them basic uh, uh, planting um, uh, methods. Eh? And we worked with uh, the district officer in uh, the Conrovia province. Uh, he basically uh, connected us to all the villages uh, through the, uh, his network. Eh? So he looks after all the districts. And apart from that, 
he connected us to the Turani Chorus because we were entering uh, village village uh, uh, boundaries. Um, as you know, it, uh, the best uh, way to go about it is following um, traditional protocol. Right? So the protocol here was, okay, let's uh, first visit the provincial office. They'll give us the list of people and then they'll actually take us down to all these villages, introduce us to the Turani Coro and the Turani Coro will uh, gather the, the whole community and then we'll start our training. So that's, uh, that's the method we, we followed. So the results, we found large numbers of trees and lemons willing to supply at a commercial rate. Uh, there's a lot of pain in the business for obvious reasons. And high cost of transporting part of barefoot trees from Pony down to Nine. So again, collecting all this data. You know, uh, didn't look really uh, good at that point in time, but now that I sit back and looking at it, you know, now I can talk about it. You know, people, please don't repeat it. Eh? Uh, there's so much lessons you can learn. So those are some of the, the trees that we were able to bring down from Honolulu. You know, looking nice, uh, all healthy, uh, pretty much ready to be planted out in the fields. Yeah? So that's okay. the team that uh, we're working on the breath at the same time. Uh, you know, why Mbole? Uh, uh, the guys from uh, Biosecurity, Ashley from CPET, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Coco Singer, Andrew McGregor, and of course, San Kumar, eh? um, a breadfruit guru in Fiji. You know, he was, he was um, at that point in time, I think was very animated and trying to tell us the difference between mark cutting and root suckers and telling us that root suckers was the way to go. So that's him uh, doing his stuff. Now. And uh, of course, our third strategy was work uh, and trying to consolidate a one level contact um, to to do this work for us, so instead of us going down to the villages, you know, maybe they could do it for us. And of course, to distribute these suckers and to private nurseries for potting, maintenance, and eventual sale. Eh? So generally a success, you know, landowners were happy to supply root suckers at a commercial rate. Uh, shipping of the root suckers was affordable and uh, project and private nurseries collectively had the capacity to pot, uh, to pot and maintain trees. So we had a, a system going and we thought that uh, it could be sustainable post project, yeah, but uh, that was not the case. Yeah. Okay, so the key. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So, key lessons here. Yeah? Uh, uh, logistically, uh, it was very difficult. So, if, if someone's uh, wanting to attempt this, uh, this kind of work again, um, my suggestion would be uh, you know, go through. Uh, uh, people have uh, been through this project, get more information from them. So, you know, so you can get an informed decision uh, if, you are, if you are trying to um, basically uh, uh, invest in a commercial breadfruit orchard. Eh? And uh, again, uh, relationships uh, is, uh, you know, uh, prove the uh, critical point there. Uh, you can't do this in isolation. You can't just rock up to a village and uh, think that you're gonna be able to get a planting material just like that. Eh? You have to work with the landowners, the resource owners. You have to be clear with them. And you also have to be smart with dealing with them. Eh? And of course, uh, the, you don't want to overwhelm them too, that it's going to be a big, big business. No, no. Uh, they are basically just part of that, that value chain. Eh? They are basically the resource owners. We supply and we basically uh, take that on to the field and try to uh, 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 in, um, uh, give farmers the um, uh, an alternative livelihood. Eh? Uh, so one thing we found out too was uh, sending smaller regular consignments rather than uh, bulk uh, shipments. Eh? Um, you know, you you don't want to go through that uh, route again. Eh? Uh, a lot of people um, uh, criticize uh, us uh, for the way we we uh, implemented the project, uh, but for us, uh, you know, all these uh, bad information uh, is uh, very very important. Eh? You really have to look at the, the risk uh, and the effort and the funding that everything that goes through it. Eh? And if you if that's well documented, uh, someone in the future will go and read about it and say, you know, uh, um, and then can make a better decision. And of course, sustainability will depend on the development of the involvement of private nurseries and vitileo. That's the only way to go about it. And uh, just to wrap it up quickly. 
I think the future is uh, with uh, Longo's team and someone who can do the same thing that Longo is doing. Eh? The future is tissue culture. You know, she talked about, uh, she just pointed out uniformity. I can't stress uniformity uh, in the, this whole uh, breadfruit game. Eh? Um, it just makes a big difference. Flowering at the same time, fruiting at the same time. Uh, you, you, can, uh, you can make good projections. Um, you know, you have uh, uniform results. You know, all of these are catchphrases for commercial bread for, uh, bread for production. Eh? So thank you everyone for your input today. Uh, Kyle Stais was uh, the guy behind the scenes for that particular project. He's a uh, value. Uh, Craig, of course, was giving his input. So I know the guys from Modi, um, Afumasanga, the salmon uh, farmers, uh, the guys from Vanuatu, Vincent Labo and his team. You know, uh, this, we were just tapping all these resources. The guys from the Caribbean, uh, we also worked with uh, the guys from North Queensland, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Andy Hill, you know. And um, so there's a lot of good information out there. Uh, so if you're wondering to take the next step, if you want to be a commercial breadfruit farmer, please uh, make sure you tap uh, into the, the, the breadfruit network, yeah? The breadfruit network, breadfruit people. Irene is the official of the breadfruit people, you know? She can link you up to um, all of the, the experts uh, that are part of the panel today. So thank you very much, guys. You know, for the time. Naka. Uh, Vinaka Levi for sharing all those lessons, you know, um, that is so valuable for people to learn from lessons like that and uh, hopefully um, not have to repeat them. So greatly appreciated that you're willing to share that and also your, your insights into where the future is going. Well, we are a bit over time. And so I'd like to um, uh, um, just um allow anyone who is participating who needs to leave for other obligations uh you're you're free to go anytime uh we won't we won't um blame you for that uh, we will go a little bit uh longer with um uh, we'll have um i know we have a, a couple of questions in the q a box a lot of the questions have been answered uh, by presenters offline I wonder if maybe that there's um, there are no open questions here right now in the Q and A box. Would you like to uh, say a few words, Kyle, um, about um, Breadfruit People's activities? Thank you, uh, Craig, and uh, thank you to all of the presenters. Um, yeah, we're just excited, uh, as um, um, the chairman mentioned. Uh, Breadfruit People really is about people. And uh, through the first set of webinars, we were able to meet so many uh, new uh, researchers, farmers working in the field. And that's why these um, uh, webinars uh, have become very useful. You know, we learn through the webinar, but more importantly is we get the opportunity to link up. And we have some cool success stories about participants uh, linking up with um, uh, webinar presenters in the first state and end up doing business together, sharing technologies around drying units. And so I just encourage you to, um, uh, to be a part of uh, the Breadfruit people. Um, uh, Irene is doing a great job with our Facebook and with our uh, emails and trying to keep the website updated. Uh, and uh, uh, we're just confident that uh, uh, with goodwill and the um, uh, the right attitude towards sharing of information that we can help each other and uh, we can solve some of the problems. Um, we were also fortunate uh, to have uh, an expert uh, in food processing, uh, Dr. Richard Baer, who is now conducting a series of uh, product development workshops. So those started this week and um, the, it's now closed. Uh, we got an overwhelming number of uh, applicants and we had to make a selection uh, and um, and uh, that will be happening over the next four weeks. Uh, we're also doing some uh, some planning work around um, you know where breadfruit people can go to best kind of serve the network. So you might hear from us uh, with some surveys and questionnaires. Um, but um, uh, otherwise, I just want to uh, just give a plug for next week, uh, which is uh, going to the Caribbean. Uh, Craig might share a little bit more, um, but again, uh, for us working. 
in our little Pacific Islands, sometimes it's hard to, to connect with, uh, with other people. And so that's what we're hoping to do. And um, uh, next week is a big bridge uh, across a lot of ocean. And I think it's going to be exciting. Maybe Craig can tell us a bit more. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. And it's just a joy to work with you and Irene and Ilea and your whole team. So thank you for establishing that, that, that way of working together. Um, so the next, uh, the next webinar, webinar number six, will be on November 4th. Um, so that's two weeks. Um, and we will highlight um, speakers from the Caribbean. And uh, if you've been to the Caribbean and poked around uh, looking at breadfruit, there's a whole parallel universe of breadfruit activities happening in the Caribbean with um, all of the same issues that we're talking about, propagation, harvesting, product development, um, agroforestry, all of those things. So we're very fortunate to have, I think we have five speakers from the Caribbean speaking on several different topics and they will be um, joining us on November 4th. And I believe maybe that's November 5th. The dates are, <laughs> are a little bit tricky. Maybe Megan, can you, can you point out the exact um, dates? Yeah, yes, Craig. Uh, the webinar six for the Caribbean will be Thursday, November 4th, Hawaii time at 11 a.m. And for Fiji, it'll be Friday, November 5th at 9 a.m. Right. And in the Caribbean, it will be, they're staying up late. So they'll be starting at around five o'clock, um, depending on the location, five in the evening. So um, we're very much looking forward to that. I just wanna thank all of our presenters today. I thought the presentations were just stunning and so uh, rich um, in information and experience. So thank you to Chairman of Famasanga to Soane, Longo, and Levi so much for presenting today. And um, also, uh, I'll just thank Megan. Megan has been working on the logistics and organizing, and she's a community facilitator and uh, a super mom, and she's made a lot of things flow very smoothly for us. So uh, and thank you to everyone. Um, and of course, we're available by email. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Long -Long. Thank you Chairman. Take care and uh, take care in Samoa. Look after yourself. Talk soon. <laughs> okay, we'll talk soon. <laughs> Thank you. Naka Craig, Naka Fosana. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. Yeah, okay.